Welcome to the Tell Us Something podcast. I'm Mark Moss. The situation is not really convenient for going back to classroom, but they say that we have to learn to live with it and to... It, it is also... It's not good not to go to school for kids, for teachers, because I don't think that the quality of work via online work is good enough, you know? You, nothing can substitute the classroom and the teacher and everything. Since around July of 2020, I have been interviewing Tell Us Something Storyteller alumni about their experience sharing a story on the Tell Us Something stage, why they chose to share a story, and what they've been up to since having shared their story. I said, if you don't help me, then I will crawl to that room where the babies are and I will see my baby. Tell Us Something welcomes everyone in the Missoula community to share a story. And to me, if you spend any amount of time in Missoula, you are a part of the community. So, this week on the podcast, join me as I talk with Nurma Dobrchanin, a mother of three little girls and a teacher at the secondary vocational school in her hometown of Roseage, Montenegro. I had to look it up too. Montenegro means Black Mountain and is a sovereign state in southeastern Europe, the youngest state in what was once Yugoslavia. That's not what I expected. I expected more people, lively streets, bustling busy streets and it's something like New York because you know we all have that perception of the USA that is presented to us through media, through films and everything but that, uh, the, what I found when I got there was something completely different, something else and that's not what I was prepared to. Nirma Dobrchanin has been teaching English for 14 years. She loves to play volleyball and is passionate about traveling. One of her childhood dreams was to visit the United States, which finally came true when she arrived in the U.S. to participate in the study of the U.S. Institute on Secondary Education through the Mansfield Center at the University of Montana. To learn more about that, visit tellussomething.org. This week on the podcast, join me as I chat with Nirma Dobichanin about life during the pandemic in Rosaj, Montenegro, a difficult pregnancy, and her experience visiting the United States. Stay with us. Big thanks to our title sponsor, The Good Food Store, and thanks to our enduring sponsors, CabinetParts.com and Blackfoot Communications. Special thanks to our champion sponsor, True Food Missoula, and huge thanks to our blue ribbon sponsor, Joyce of Tile. How's your evening going? Fine. I'm mostly at home. We don't have lockdown anymore. Things are getting better with coronavirus. Do you have lockdown now? I wish we did. I wish that we did. We don't. You didn't have it at all? We did. We had it in March and April. And then in May, it was tourist season and the governor opened up the state. And the tourists have arrived. They're coming from all over the country and people are not wearing masks. Hey, it's Mark. As I was editing our interview, I realized that I didn't let you know when Nirma and I were talking. It's important to place our conversation in context and know that we had this conversation in August of 2020. Okay, back to the show. Um, We have 4,481 confirmed cases. In Montana. In Montana. And 65 deaths. That's a lot, I suppose. It seems like a lot to me. And they're talking about reopening the schools in a couple of weeks. And that's, I don't have any kids, but that seems terrifying. The same here. Yeah. They're talking about going back to school there? Yes. We, I think we will be back in school, but the situation is not really convenient for going back to classroom. But they say that we have to learn to live with it and to... It is also, it's not good not to go to school for kids, for teachers, because I don't think that the quality of work via online work is good enough, you know? You, nothing can substitute the classroom and the teacher and everything. Also, kids are, because they're not in school since March, the same, we had lockdown here. And they, they're losing their uh, working habits. They're losing their contact with their peers. And they're not socializing. Kids are becoming, like, aggressive. Or maybe uh, they have the, uh, depression and things like that. So they're trying to put them back to 
their like natural uh, environment in the classroom with their peers, friends and everything. So that's what they're thinking about right now. But when it's about the virus, I think it's really dangerous. What's, do you know what the plan is in Montenegro? No, we don't have nothing official. These are just like rumors and things that are, that you can hear in around, but not nothing official from the government, from the Ministry of Education and something like that. But we, they're just talking about it, but nothing, we don't have like official plan or something. These are just recommendations and some, Experts like psychologists and many others are suggesting that we should go back to school, but we don't have the final decision from ministry. And well, even with the final decision, then like, well, let's talk about what the plan is going to be. How are we going? They will have to have a plan. Yeah, what does that look like? I have no idea. See, I'm a teacher. I still don't know. They say that it's about time they told us something that we can lean against and that we have something to plan. And but still nothing by by this time in normal circumstances i would have my plans my curriculum everything and now i don't know what to do not just me i mean everybody all the teachers and all the educational system we are like stuck we don't know we're waiting for their instructions for the final decisions but still nothing so we we will be in trouble uh, with uh due dates with uh time with everything what I don't know very much about the education system, the way it's structured in Montenegro. Can you tell me what uh, what does it look like for as far as grade levels go? Do you do it like that, the way we do in the United States? Well, it's similar, but we have uh, we divided it like schools. We have primary school, which is nine grades. So after that, we have high school, four grades. And that the next level is faculty and university level, which also differ like two years, like bachelor or three years. And then like, I don't know, four years, five or six years, PhD and master level and so on. So it's like the first nine years, primary school, and then high school, next four years. And where do you fall as a teacher in that? I'm at high school. You're teaching high school. What subjects do you teach? Only English. Only English. Do you know that I haven't worked since uh, I came to Montana and Missoula? Because when I came back, we had our holiday. And then in September, I was pregnant and my pregnancy was like uh, qualified as high risk pregnancy. So I had to take my uh, sick leave or pregnancy leave. How do you call it? And then in January 2019, I had my baby and then I have my maternity leave. We have it for one year. And when I was supposed to go back, I mean, I got back into the classroom. I started working in March and then 15 uh, days later, we had that Corona situation. So I stopped working. So when you count that, it would be like, Two years without classroom and uh, without work, without being in classroom. I mean, I am officially working, but not in classroom. What does that feel like? Feels like a little bit like, I feel like I'm forgetting the language, you know, I'm forgetting my, I am in contact with language when, let's say, watching films, listening to music and everything, but teaching and everything, I feel like it's getting out of my hands that I am not expert I used to be. It's like I'm forgetting things. I'm, sometimes I feel like I would be, I don't know, conf not confused, but maybe scared if I go back to classroom again. <laughs> like when you just start working for the first time and I am, I can say I am experienced teacher. I have 14 years of experience in school. If you take these two not working, then it's like, well, without these last two years being in classroom. So I hope I will go back to, to it. I will, when I start working, but things are so 
confusing right now and I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to do, how to manage and cope with all this new situation with online teaching and everything. So I will see. I still don't know. The only problem is that I feel like I'm forgetting the language, the very language, because I don't communicate. I don't use it. You can call me anytime if you want to practice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Of course. What, what time would it be? What, if it's, Six o'clock now. We are here. Yeah. Five minutes past six. Right. So I'm thinking about if it's 6 p.m. in Montana, what time would it be there? I'm trying to do the math. You just take eight hours difference. You just take uh, uh, minus eight hours. 8 p.m. minus. So two o'clock in the morning. Yes. September 16th. If you want to tune in to the Tell Us Something live stream, we're going to do a, a live stream. <laughs> I, I think I will because it's not unusual for me that I'm not sleeping at that time. So I will probably be there. All right. I'll send you a reminder. I'm just trying to catch up with you and see what you've been up to. Because I, I know that when uh, you were telling the story, you were – really missing your family and you were concerned about being pregnant. What happened after, after you left Montana? Well, when I came back here, I went to see the doctor and at that time, everything was okay. But I told them that I had those issues and problems in Montana and they, they told me that we'll be monitoring, just take care of yourself. Right now, everything seems okay. I had to do those, those tests because I was 33 at that time and I did you you probably have double test triple test for you know for anomalies and everything and all the tests turned out great I had no possible risks for um, those diseases or let's say chromosomal abnormalities and so on so I was like okay my pregnancy is doing fine but later in September, I think, I had some problems again, and I went to see the doctor, and they told me, this is serious, you have to stay in bed, you have to go to hospital to be in bed since delivery, or you can go home, but you mustn't do anything, you must stay in your bed, somebody has to help you with everything, because my diagnosis was placenta previa, and it's like... It's complicated. You you can't make sudden moves. You have to be still in order to go out till the end of the pregnancy and not to have premature baby and so on. So I did. I stayed in bed. And during all that period of time, I had some, let's say, sinister feeling. I thought that something would be wrong, but I kept thinking thinking it's because of your pregnancy, you know, it's high-risk pregnancy, you didn't experience something like that beforehand, my two first pregnancies were like perfect without any problems or anything, but I always had in my mind that this is not it, something else is about to happen, and, but I didn't want to think about it, okay, I have high-risk pregnancy, I will do everything doctors say, I will stay in bed, and I stay in bed at home, but then maybe a month before I deliver, I had to go to hospital, to stay in hospital. They told me that they have to monitor me in every single moment because things could get complicated. And I went to the hospital and one night I had severe bleeding and they told me that they need to do emergency C-section that night. And I said, okay. They took me there, and I was thinking, you know, at that moment when I was on that table, okay, this is it. Now everything will pass. You will have your baby. Everything will be okay. Don't worry. But I couldn't help myself not to think that it's not the end. Something else will be more difficult for me, more complicated. Things are not getting better. But okay, then they put me asleep, and when I woke up you know uh from the c-section i i was when i was becoming aware that what happened that i'm awaking from the c-section operation i was just trying to stay 
is my baby okay? You know, I couldn't speak clearly because of the anesthesia and everything. And the nurse was beside me and she was saying, it's all, everything is okay, don't worry, you have to get rest. Please just stay calm, don't move. You had a complicated C-section, it lasted for two hours, which is not normal. Normal would be like half an hour or something like that. But I was keep asking, is my baby okay? Please just tell me how is my baby? And she was just saying, good, good, nothing more than that. So I knew that something, something is wrong. And my husband called me maybe an hour later when I totally woke up, when I could speak clearly and everything. And he told me, you know, he congratulated me, our baby and everything. And he told me, you know, doctors think that something might be wrong. You know, she has some facial problems. I thought, what kind of facial problem? What is wrong with the baby? And uh, But I knew, I really knew that because I felt that. I felt that in my guts, you know. And he said, I don't know, maybe the position of a baby in your belly wasn't good. They say that it will be okay, maybe in a couple of hours. She has some dysmorphia of the face or something like that. And first I thought that maybe her eyes are not in the right place or her nose or different things were in my head, coming through my head. And I told, okay, bye. And I wanted to get up to see the baby. And the nurse said, no way you can get up. You can't get up. You will faint, you will be in trouble for your life, no possible way that you can get up. And they told me that the baby was in the incubator, you know, and that she has to stay there, she has to have oxygen and everything, and they can't bring it to me. But I insisted that I will get up to see my baby, you know. I said, if you don't help me, then I will crawl to that room where the babies are and I will see my baby. And when they saw my determination, they said, okay, uh, there were two of them. They were trying to help me to get up from the bed and everything. And I really felt dizzy, nauseous and horrible, but I wanted to go to that room. And when I entered that room, there were many incubators. And I looked at the first one on the right. I saw a baby and I thought, okay, this baby looks normal and everything is okay with this baby. This baby isn't mine. I'm going further. But they stopped me and said, oh, this is your baby. I said, this is my baby. They said, yes. I, and I said, what is wrong with this baby? I don't see anything wrong. This baby seems very cute and perfectly fine to me. They said, yes, but you see, she has a little bit upward slanted eyes and and immediately when they told me that, can you notice her eyes are upward slanted and everything, I, the shape of her eyes, I knew what they were thinking, that they thought about Down syndrome, you know. And at that moment, I felt like kind of relief because I was wondering what could possibly be wrong, what kind of dysmorphia was, was it about, you know. I, I was thinking about things like, ruined face or something like that so i thought oh that's what you think is wrong that phenotype reminded them of down syndrome and i said okay but i couldn't see that you know we usually uh, i mean my family most of my family members cousins and everybody we have naturally upward slanted eyes and i thought oh that can't be that it's just that genetics that we have that shape of eyes it's just normal I don't think she has down syndrome and I felt some kind of relief you know but then I insisted to talk to the doctor and the doctor came pediatrician and she told me you know except those eyes she also has has a single crease across one palm that's also one of the markers for down syndrome and she she has a little bit of hypotonia but I, can, I don't claim that she has Down syndrome. You know, when I see that children have Down syndrome, I immediately tell parents, for, for, but for your baby, I'm not quite sure. We are going to send you to our capital to do the testing, karyotyping, and then you will know for sure. And that's what they did. They 
transferred us to our capital town and uh, they accepted the baby there. I had to stay home in hotel and wh wherever, it doesn't matter, but I couldn't be with my baby. And they did all the testings and checking and everything, screenings, all things that are normally, that they normally do when it's about Down syndrome, to check her heart, her other organs and everything, if there are any diseases and everything turned out to be okay. She was a really healthy baby, you know, but I had to wait for Karotype for about a month, four weeks. They told me she seems fine. She's healthy. There is nothing wrong with her. All tests came back great and you can go home, but you will have to wait for the final result for the, if she has Down syndrome. I also talked to a genetics uh, do you call genetics doctors for? And she told me, okay, I can see a few markers, but I really cannot be sure. I mean, she she's constantly with those kids. That's what she does. That's her job. But she couldn't be sure about my baby if she had Down syndrome or not. And I was sent home. And during that month, I was thinking about everything. I was trying to pick myself up to accept the fact if she has Down syndrome, that that's my baby, it doesn't matter, everything will be okay, we will live normal life. And I was happy that she was healthy, she didn't have congenital heart disease like it's normally a, a situation with Down syndrome babies and everything. She didn't have anything. She actually started to uh, try to be a very healthy baby to uh, lift her head up in the first 20 days and be very strong. and eat very well so i i thought maybe she's healthy but anyway i was ready for the result one month later they called me to go to the hospital to receive the diagnosis and i told them if she has down syndrome just tell me because it's 200 kilometers away from my hometown our capital town they told me no we have to see you you have to come in person i said i am ready just tell me if my baby has Down syndrome, that's fine. That's totally fine with me. I am not going to cry. I'm not going to just, if you can send me the result, um, fax or whatever, email. And they told me, no, we have to see you in person. And then I started to be worried again. Why do they have to see me in person if there is, if there was something other, some other things wrong with her or so I had another, I was worried, you know, and we went there, so I was really scared. I didn't know what to expect. Down syndrome would be like, okay, she has Down syndrome, that's it, please just let's end it with this. But I didn't know if they are going to tell me something more. And when I came to uh, genetics, she told me, okay, now we have the result of your baby's karyotype. You know, your baby has 70, we tested like 100 cells. And 70 cells came out normal. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, 70 of her tested cells are normal, have normal karyotypes. She doesn't have trisomy. And I said, okay, and what about the, ter the other 30 cells? She said, well, in the other 30 cells, we found one extra chromosome, on the 21st pair of chromosomes. So it's trisomy 21, Down syndrome. So I said, what does it mean? She said, it's not a typical Down syndrome. It's the mosaic Down syndrome. Uh, so your baby has the mixture of cells, two types of cells in her body, which is not really usual. When you have children with Down syndrome, all of their body, all of their cells have that extra chromosome, you know? And when it's about mosaic Down syndrome, you have a mixture of cells, normal cell lines, and another cell line with trisomy 21. So it's really rare. It's like in 100 cases of Down syndrome, you will find one or two children with the, this type of Down syndrome, very rare. So the development and thriving and everything, it really differs from child to child. She told me, you can expect from her to be just like any other child, or she can be just like any Down syndrome child. I have all the difficulties that, down syndrome children have. I said, so is it better or worse than typical Down syndrome? She told me, of 
course, it, it's better because she has 70% of normal cells, normal makeup of cells. But in those 30%, we don't know where they are located. We just took her blood, but those cells can be anywhere. And you can expect unex unexpected with her, you know. You, you will never, you will see while she is growing up what kind of difficulties she would have if she, if she has them or she would be just like any adult, other typical Down syndrome child. So I was surprised by that diagnosis. I didn't know about that Down syndrome type. I just <laughs> knew about Down syndrome and not Down syndrome, but uh, that was something new for me. And I said, okay, this can be good. It doesn't, oh, you are... I mean, I was telling to myself, you are prepared for the worst, for the Down syndrome, total trisomy or, or full trisomy, as it is called. But this situation can be better, you know, for, for your girl, for you. And I thought, okay, this is like another chance for us to, to be happy, to, to enjoy her development, her thriving and everything. And by now, she's now 18 months old. She didn't have any difficulties. Completely just a regular development, regular baby. She also doesn't have that many, uh, you know, markers. When you see her, you, you don't expect that she would have Down syndrome. If you, if you don't know, then you would, wouldn't notice. So I will send you photos if you want to. And she's actually very advanced when compared to other children, regular, typical children. For example, she started crawling when she was seven months old. She started walking with a year, maybe 13 months that she could walk on her own. And right now she's that active that you just cannot catch up with her. <laughs> she is great, amazing child. She started talking. She's 18 months old now and she has her first words. And I, I cannot say that I am not happy. I know that I've been through a very, very difficult period. I didn't know what to expect. I still don't know what to expect. Maybe expect there would be some, uh, I don't know, challenges with her and maybe some difficult, difficulties in the future. But until now, she really surprised us positively. And our doctor, too, she said, I have never seen something similar. She is an amazing child. and she denied the medicine everything that medicine says for the down syndrome and these children she denied everything in her case everything is just opposite she's just like any other typical baby even advanced in some fields what's her name iskra iskra means spark in my spark yes iskra in my mother tongue beautiful that would be my experience by now. If there are any other surprises, then I will let you know. <laughs> okay. For photos of Nurma's daughter, Iskra, which translates into English to spark, visit tellussomething.org. After Nurma shared her story about Iskra, we took a deep breath before moving on to talk about her tell us something story. When we come back, Nurma and I dissect her tell us something story. Then you'll have the opportunity to hear the story as she shared it live on stage at the Wilma back in June of 2018. Stay with us. Thanks again to our title sponsor, The Good Food Store. Dedicated to supporting a healthy community, The Good Food Store provides a wide selection of organic food and natural products. Shop less, shop solo, and shop fast. Now offering curbside pickup. Learn more at goodfoodstore.com. Thanks also to our enduring sponsors, CabinetParts.com, the number one source for cabinet hardware since 1997. Providing the best kitchen cabinet hardware at a great price and knowledgeable hardware specialists, CabinetParts.com is the direct source for all of your cabinet hardware needs. Blackfoot Communications. Since 1954, Blackfoot Communications have fostered a reputation based on exceptional customer service and community involvement. Blackfoot Communications delivers superior technology solutions through trusted relationships and enrich the lives of their customers, employees, and owners. Learn more at blackfoot.com. Thanks to our champion sponsor, True Food Missoula, offering weekly meal delivery to nourish your family and friends, 
have a look at the menu and order online at truefoodcsa.com. Huge thanks to our Blue Ribbon sponsor, Joyce of Tile. Licensed and insured in Montana, Joyce of Tile specializes in interior finish work. Joyce of Tile provides you with tile installation that will enhance your home for years to come. Learn more at joyceoftile.com. So when you arrived in Montana, you describe in your story, it was so dark. Yes. I actually thought about your story before we agreed to talk. I thought about your story when we had our lockdown because I wanted to see what is it like in the city when no one is out. And I went for a walk at night and everything was quiet. Like, and I thought, oh, this must have been what it was like for Nurma when she arrived. Did you know that it was going to be like that when you got here? Did anybody prepare you for what it would be like to come to Montana? No, definitely not. That's not what I expected. I expected more people, lively streets, bustling, busy streets. And it's something like New York because, you know, we all have that perception of the USA that is presented to us through media, through films and everything. But that, what I found when I got there was something completely different something else and that's not what I was prepared to I thought where are these people where am I nobody here why is it so silent and no cars no people it wasn't that uh, late it was about midnight I think so I expected that there would be something happening but (laughs) really it was so you arrived you got settled in, you made a friend the next day. That's right. And then what was it like when you finally met all of the people that you were going to spend the next, what was it, six weeks with? You know, I am going to tell you from this perspective, from uh, what I see it right now, it really was a life-changing experience for me. When I'm thinking about that, everything that happened there, the experience I had, Right now, it seems to me that that was just a dream, that it wasn't real. It's impossible that something like that exists. You know, uh, people like in Missoulian people and the sceneries, the landscapes, the country, everything seems like unreal. It it was really a life-changing experience for me. And when I think that I... I don't think that I would ever go back there because I don't think that I will have another opportunity uh, for that. But if I was asked now, for example, okay, we will take you anywhere you want in the world. What would that be right now? Or or during my whole life, I, th- I think that will be my only desire just to go back to Montana and Missoula once again because it's something, the, mo- the most beautiful experience I have ever had in my life. And I would like to see Marge again. I would like to see uh, Panzer Hall again. I would like to see uh, you, Anna, those host family I had uh, in Montana and Missoula. So you all seem like unreal for me now because you were all so kind, so generous. So it's just not real how much you amaze me, you all guys, really. I speak that from the bottom of my heart because you don't find it here. You, don't, you won't find it here. People in whole Europe, I think, but also in Montenegro are not that generous, are not that open-hearted, let's say, are not so friendly. And when I was there, I was thinking, wait, are they, all, are they always like this or this is just some special occasion? Do they know that I'm stranger, so just they want to show their hospitality and everything. But no, you Missoulian people and Montana people are so amazing, are so, I don't know how to describe you, (laughs) what words to use. It's just that you have special place in my heart, all of you, especially Missoula and Montana. So that would be my wish till the end of my life that I go back there and see everything again, because it's like, just like, fairy tale it really is it's not that i didn't travel i traveled a lot i visited almost whole europe you know and i have never met anything or anyone like 
people from Missoula. The internet connection was a little unstable here for a while. Once it evened out, Nirma described her love for Missoula. The Missoula community really made her feel welcome. And listening to her, I felt a lot of pride for our community welling up inside of me. So you had this incredible experience in Montana. And I know you also went to Washington, D.C. Where else did you go? South Carolina, Charleston, and Washington, D.C., and that's it. I have to tell you that Montana and South Carolina are complete, two completely different things, completely different states. Everything that you can see in Montana and feel, <laughs> you won't find it in South Carolina and the opposite, vice versa. When I was in South Carolina, in Charleston, I felt completely different spirit of the, the country and the town. It led me into opposite direction, you know. In Montana, I felt all those natural and genuine nature and nice people, kind people, and everything was, um, I don't know how to describe, just open. And when I went to Charleston, it was like, People with good cars or with bad cars. People with, uh, who have money or who don't have money. We talked for a while more about the differences Nirma observed between Montana and North Carolina. And that conversation took us in many different directions. We agreed to wrap it up after almost an hour on the call. I think we're close to finishing up. And I wonder um, if there's anything about your story that we haven't talked about that you would like our listeners to know in about that uh that moment in on the stage well i have to tell you that i was scared when i went out to that stage and i didn't expect that many people i didn't expect that big show and i was confused i said oh my god i am going to to block my brain i won't be able to say anything so if there were some things that I wanted to, to share, I think that I missed a couple of things and I forgot to, to say a couple of things <laughs> then just because of those reflectors, lights, and so huge audience that I didn't expect. But I think I made my point, but there were some details that I forgot to mention. Have you listened to the story since then? Well, a couple of times when I just when I came back from Montana with my friends who didn't listen to it and then we listened to it together but then I forgot about it the time was passing and the, the last time I was listening to it was when you contacted me I wanted to remind myself because you reminded me of everything and then I I found it at the, the podcast you sent me and I listened to it again I think I tell it better. I, I should have uh, said some details and some things that I think would be interesting to people of Missoula, but I tell I I was just confused. I was surprised with the whole show. So now you have that opportunity. What details would you have included? Well, I forgot to tell how kind my coordinator was. I just mentioned that she left me in the room but i didn't mention and that's what i felt sorry how uh, open she was for me she she offered her help nirma is speaking of dina mensur the director of the project that brought nirma to the united states the program is provided through the mansfield center at the university of montana the program is called the study of the u.s institute for global secondary educators to learn more about that program visit tellussomething.org she actually gave me strength and she when she took me from the airport to to Panzer Hall, we were talking like we knew each other for a hundred of years. And that that I think that helped me to spend that night better than because when I was thinking about her, how kind she was, how how she helped me and everything, then I I forgot to tell her thank you and that I forgot to mention that she helped me that much that night because I didn't emphasize enough how she 
you know, was there for me that night when she left me. It wasn't just, just she left me and she, uh, she went. She talked to me and she explained me everything. She gave me all the necessary things I needed and told me what should I do in certain situations. So that was a relief. And, and that's what I forgot to say. And, and I forgot to tell thank you to her. And that's Dina, of course. I think you already know. I actually have to call her husband today. So I'll have him pass that along to her. Okay, please do that. <laughs> yeah, I will. Is there anything else, Nerma? Nothing else. If you want, I'm going to send you my baby's photos. I would love that. Do you do you share that in your show or would you like me to? I would like maybe. I want them to see how okay. sweet she is because when I was talking about uh, my first experience and when they told me about her the face and everything, people will think, How does that baby look like? So I would like to send you photos so that people see how cute she is actually. All right, I will put them up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic evening. The same to you. Thank All you. Right. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. For photos of Nurma's daughter, Iskra, visit telesomething.org. Thanks again for listening to my interview with Nurma Dobachaman this week on the Telesomething podcast. Coming up, Nurma's story. Fresh off the plane from Rosage, Montenegro, Nurma Dobachaman is disoriented by her surroundings in Missoula. Feeling lonely and hungry, she finds a friend who helps her adapt. Nerma's story was recorded in front of a live audience on June 13th at the Wilma in Missoula, Montana. Nerma calls her story Resident Evil Fairy Tale or Salvation in Missoula. Well, one of the biggest dilemmas I have ever had in my life was whether to come here or not. Because it was really hard for me to leave my two little girls for five weeks, and it's still hard. But eagerness to come to visit the USA and to learn more about its culture, people, customs, and everything was so strong. So I decided to come anyway, as you can see. <laughs> so after a 24-hour-long journey, flight, which wasn't very comfortable because the space was too small, I couldn't sleep at all. And at the same time, I'm so scared of flying. And it's just not the fear that I was going to die in the plane. I felt really responsible for my two little girls, as well as for my unborn child. So I was constantly scared, anxious, nervous. My palms were constantly sweating. I could hear my heartbeat, and it wasn't pleasant at all. So finally, we landed how happy I was to be in Missoula. But then again, Missoula? Wait, where the hell am I? <laughs> I have never heard about Missoula before. I found out that I was going to participate in this program. So I felt like I was lost. I was at least 10,000 miles away from my home and from my family, and I was alone. And then I saw my coordinator. I was so happy to see her. But she only helped me lodging and settle, and she went. I was alone in my room. And when I say alone, it means alone not just in room, but also in the whole building where we were staying, because I came a day earlier before all other participants. So I was a bit scared. That awkward silence was killing me. I looked through the window, and there were no people around. Usually, you can see people in my country. That was something about the midnight. But here, there was nobody, not even a car to, to go past. I was thinking, where, what, what? Is this Resident Evil, or where am I? <laughs> so, <sighs> but it was really hard for me at that moment. Uh, I wanted to call my family to see if they're okay and to say that I'm, I was fine. And when I reached my phone, I saw that the battery was dead. Okay, I will recharge it, but then the plug was not the same as those in Europe. 
so dead phone, all alone, 10,000 miles away from home, without any people, nor in building or <laughs> around. <laughs> so at that moment, I felt desperate. I started crying. And I was also feeling hungry as I was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so I was waiting for morning. And finally, morning came. I wanted to go to look around and to see if there is any place where I could find something to eat. But I was walking and walking and walking, and I didn't see anyone, because during uh, this time, campus is empty. There are no students. There is nobody. So I was wondering, God, please help. <laughs> Do something. <laughs> And then finally, in the distance, I saw a lady with hiking sticks. <gasps> Thank you, God. I went there, and I said, excuse me, do you know if there is any nice place to eat here, somewhere nearby? And then she told me, mm, if you come to my house, I will take a car, and I'll take you there. Well, at that moment, after all those after the stress I had, the only thing that crossed my mind was those American films I watched with serial killers <laughs> and people having victims in their basements and a lot of different stuff. So I was like, <laughs> I don't know. But then I looked into her eyes, her transparent blue eyes. And somehow I felt that Marge was lonely as I was. And I felt some harmony and immediate connection with her. And I told myself, yes, she was sent by God. Go with her. Go to her house. <laughs> and we went there. As soon as I entered the house, I saw many prayers on the table. It was kind of relief for me. And I felt, like, safe and a lot better than the previous night. And she took her car. And while, uh, when we started driving toward downtown, she kind of went to freeway. And I was wondering, oh, sorry, where, where are we going? <laughs> but it, I saw at some point that she's going downtown. She actually wanted to take me to her favorite place to eat. So... We came there, and she took me through the town. She showed me around. She took me to her favorite place. We were having lunch together, and I couldn't believe how kind she was, how she helped me to fulfill that uh, emptiness and that feeling of loneliness that was really strong. But not just her. People are so kind here in Missoula. As we were walking through I couldn't believe that so many people want to speak to strangers. They want to show them around. They're eager to know about you. Uh, they're asking you questions. They offer you to help with anything. So that Resident Evil town from the last night, actually, with the daylight, become, became something a lot more beautiful than I expected. And I was like, I'm not in that story anymore. I'm to a completely different story, like a fairy tale. So I would really like to thank you, Missoulian people, to thank Marge for everything. Thank you. If you want to support what we do, you can do that financially by donating. Go to telesummy.org and click the handshake support icon in the top right hand corner. You can also tell someone about the show. Recommend Tell Us Something to just two people who have never heard it. Please rate and review this podcast on your podcast app. If you ever want to drop me a line, you can write to mark at tellussomething.org. That's M-A-R-C at tellussomething.org. Thanks to Cash for Junkers who provided the music for the podcast. Find them at cashfordrunkersband.com. Thanks to our sponsors, Missoula Bone & Joint providing superior clinical orthopedic care to their patients for over 60 years, MissoulaBoneAndJoint.com, Axis Physical Therapy, an enthusiastic team 
dedicated to providing compassionate and comprehensive care to their clients. Learn more at accessmissoula.com. Thank you to our in-kind sponsors, Logjam Presents. Learn about their dining opportunities at the Top Hat Restaurant, as well as upcoming events at logjampresents.com. Missoula Broadcasting Company. Learn more at missoulabroadcasting.com. Float Missoula. Learn more at floatmsla.com. Geckodesigns.com. Missoulaevents.net. Podcast production by me, Mark Moss. To learn more about Tell Us Something, please visit tellusomething.org. Stay safe. Wear a mask. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And stay home when you can. Next week, I'll start with a brief sabbatical of sorts from the podcast. Producing the podcast is a lot of work, often requiring over 10 hours to produce a one-hour episode. I need to prioritize some other obligations for Tell Us Something right now, so starting next week and during the month of March, the Tell Us Something podcast will be on a brief hiatus. While we're gone, I encourage you to binge watch stories on the YouTube channel and subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss our next episode. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in April.